Well, good morning. I see everyone out this morning. We have so many visitors. We're happy you're with us. We have visitors from far and wide, and your presence is an encouragement to us. This morning's lesson is entitled, Five Brothers in Danger. I, open, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Luke 16, as that will serve as our base text this morning, focusing and especially in verses 27 to 28 and verse 30. They remind us of what's happening in Luke 16, just to give a little bit of recap. We're not going to be able to read this entire account. But in Luke 16, 19 to 31, this is the account of the rich man and Lazarus, the poor man. And Jesus tells this, this account, and some people want to look at it as a parable. Some people want to look at it as something that was true and that, would, and that had happened. Regardless of how you look at it, the thing is, Jesus doesn't refer to it as a parable. He talks about it as if it happened. And in parables, he didn't normally name people. And here the poor man's name is given as Lazarus. But be that as it may, this account is important in that Jesus tells us that both men died. And they both went somewhere. They both died together. They both went somewhere together, but far apart. One in bliss and the other in torment. And both separated by an uncrossable chasm. That one from one side could not get to the other. The other on the other side could not get to the other one. He made it very clear that they both physically died. And that both men, even after death, were still living in some form. With their consciousness intact. They knew who each other were. They knew what their families were. They didn't just wake up somewhere and say, I don't know who I am, but this is terrible. And the other one saying, this is great. They had their conscience intact. They knew exactly who they were, what their former life was like. But we also read that the rich man who woke in torments felt pain and regret. These are something physical that we can identify with and something emotional. There was regret to his decisions in life that brought him here. In Luke 16, 23 to 24, we read that Jesus says the rich man could see, feel, speak, and hear. It wasn't just some nebulous thing that his, and he's going to remain unconscious until the judgment day. He's somewhere where he knows where he is and why he's there. And we get that we get to that in verses 27 and 28. In verses 24 to 26, we read he could experience thirst. He asked Abraham to send Lazarus over with him to bring him water, and he says he was in agony in this plane. Here's where Abraham tells him, there's a gulf from the King James. There's a gulf, there's a chasm, an abyss that separates the two, one they cannot cross over. And what we want to focus in this morning is that the man expressed concern for his family. In particular, he said he had five brothers. Read with me in Luke 16, starting in verse 27. This is right after finding out there's an uncrossable chasm between them. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. The hymn is speaking of Lazarus. If Lazarus can't cross this uncrossable barrier to bring me water to relieve some of my pain and agony, send him to my father's house, he said. Send him back from the dead. Verse 28, For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said in verse 30, But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Send Lazarus to them, is what he's saying, so that they also may not come to this place of torment. Verse 24, he described this place as being agony in this flame. And he says in verse 34, If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. That means he knows they're lost. That's one thing that he knew about his five brothers. They were lost. They had not repented of their sins. And he's saying, send Lazarus back this great miracle. That'll bring them back. That'll make them be right with God. And they will repent. What we get from this account is that this man's five brothers were in danger. And he wanted them warned. And this is going to be kind of the focus this morning. is not on the rich man, but on his brothers. From just this short, brief account, there are several things we can glean that we know about that his brothers had. And their, what they had reflects what the lost has in the world. You know, there's an old adage that says, misery loves company. I would add an except there. Except in torments awaiting judgment, as we see this man say in Luke 16, 24. And if misery did not love company, 
in, in Hades awaiting judgment, I would assume they also do not love company in hell. Matthew 25, 41 describes it as an eternal fire. Verse 46 calls that eternal fire an eternal punishment. What these five brothers in danger had mirrors or reflects what those of the world have today that are lost in their sins, that they also need to repent. So this morning's focus is going to be on these five brothers and what they had and talking about the danger that they were in. And we're going to recognize that what they had, everyone we know of in the world that is lost also has these things. One, they had a brother in torments. In Luke 16, 22 to 24, their brother was the rich man who died and who was in torments in agony in this flame. Perhaps at their brother's funeral, they, like so many religious people today, thought he's with God now. And in fact, in their case, they could easily say he was a Jew. We're God's chosen people. There's no way he would be in punishment. He's with God. Of course he would go to heaven. That's what religious leaders of Jesus' day thought and felt about their own selves. They thought, well, all the sinners the, and the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they're all going to hell, but not us. Not the learned and experts in the law. And Jesus told them over and over and over again, they erred not really knowing the scriptures. And he told them over and over and over again to repent. But perhaps this man's brothers, just like those religious leaders of the day, thought, not us. Not us. Many people today have relatives in torments that they're probably not even aware of. One of the things that when you talk and study with people, especially people that are coming from a, a religious background that they're told they've inherited, there are those that say, well, I was born into this, and that's what my parents were, and my grandfather, and his grandfather, and his grandfather, and that's what we are. And you get them to see the truth, and they will even acknowledge that what they've been practicing and teaching and believing is wrong. And right before they obey, they say this, well, if... I obey the scriptures, then it's saying that my parents, my grandparents, generations and generations of my family are all wrong, and that means if they're dead, they're in hell. And so I can't do that. I can't betray them, and so I'm going to stay whatever it is. What they don't realize is their relatives who now know that they're wrong don't want them to make that decision. Their relative is like that rich man in torment saying, no, repent. Do something different with your life. The scriptures plainly teach that there is separation at death and an eternal one at the judgment day. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, there's no excuse for not knowing and not being prepared. Their five brothers in danger had sins not repented of. In Luke 16, 28 and verse 30, their brother, the rich man in torments, knew that they needed to repent, which suggests they may have been living similar to him. Look in Luke 16, verse 19. It says, now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Now there's nothing wrong with enjoying material blessings and enjoying material riches. The problem here seems to be his focus was on those things and not on pleasing the Lord, because he awoke in torments, while the poor man was transported by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. There is a stark difference in how the two men even ended up where they both went. And in verse and in verse 30. I'm sorry, in verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. Again, remember there it's not a sin to have money and even to enjoy money. Over and over we can read through the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that when we enjoy the labors of our work, that is our reward. We're able to do those things. The focus seems to be that it was only on himself, not on God. He only did those things that were pleasing to him. I'm reminded over and over when Jesus says about those who demonstrate hypocrisy, that they will have their reward in full in this life. It seems like that's what Abraham is telling him. You had your reward in full, and now you're paying the price for not obeying God. In Luke 13, 3 and verse 5, Jesus says, unless one repents, they will perish. He says in John 8, 24, unless one believes that I am the one that is sent, I am the anointed one, the Christ, he will die in his sins. 
Revelation 2.5. Members of the church at Ephesus, going back to verse 1, were told to repent or their lampstand would be removed. What he's saying is, and if you go back to chapter 1, Jesus describes what those golden lampstands represented. He said there were seven golden lampstands. They represented the churches, and then there are seven letters, one to each of those churches in Asia. <laughs> Jesus says, repent or your lampstand would be removed. What he's saying is, you'll no longer belong to me. You might as well change your name because you don't belong to me. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about some churches like that tonight. The point is, as we look to Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15, and ask you to turn there with me, we see that for the five brothers and those in the world today and throughout time that have been unrepentant, it's a scary thing to face the Lord in an unrepentant condition. In Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, 31 that the king will gather all the nations to him, the small and the great. He'll divide them like a shepherd divides sheep and goats, some to the right, some to the left. And then he speaks to those on his right and then we find out they're the righteous. He speaks to those on his left and find out they're the wicked. And both of them have two different but yet eternal destinies. Verse 46, the righteous to eternal life, the wicked to eternal punishment. John has this great privilege to see a vision of what Jesus talked about in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. It starts in Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Remember in Hebrews chapter 4, when it talks about the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword? And then after that, in verse 12, it says, his, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are laid bare before him to whom we have to do. That's what he's talking about here. There is no place to hide from this great king. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, the great and the small. You could also say the rich and the poor. The great and the small standing before the throne. And books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. If you can imagine what agony and torment looked like in Hades awaiting judgment, imagine what the torment and agony are going to look like in an eternal lake of fire. It's a scary thing to face the Lord unrepentant. These five brothers... They were in danger because they also they had a brother in torments that could not repent for them. Now this man, after having recognized what he had done with his life and where it had brought him, and he says, I want you to send Lazarus back so he can warn my family so they don't come here. He could not repent for them. It was too late. Anything he could have said or done was too late. Now he's awaiting judgment for his actions. In Luke 16, 30, their brother, the rich man, wanted them mourn badly enough. He wanted Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead, saying that, well, if someone rose from the dead, they would repent and they could be saved from coming here. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter, talking to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, the ones he accused of murdering the Christ, he says in verse 36, This man whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And they said, they were pricked in their hearts, verse 37, they said, what do we do? We're, we're guilty of murder. Under the old law, they knew what that entailed. Their sin was as David's when Nathan the prophet told David, You will not die. Your sin has been forgiven. David was guilty of death. Here, these Jews on the day of Pentecost assembled before the apostles. They too were guilty of death. And they said, what do we do? Peter said, repent, every one of you, in the name of the Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord for the forgiveness of sins. How do they have forgiveness? By repenting. And they each individual had to repent. No one else could do it for them. Certainly no one that is already dead. And certainly no one else alive can repent for someone else. They were responsible for their own actions, and we find that 3,000 came forward. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, 
as Paul was talking to the people in Athens on the, in the Areopagus or Mars Hill. And he wraps up his sermon to them in verse 30. He says, God no longer overlooks the times of ignorance, but he commands, commands every man everywhere to repent. And then he tells them why in verse 31. There is a day of judgment fixed, furnished proof by one risen from the dead. And that's where he lost the Athenians. Not even their great heroes who were gods that had been killed had risen from the dead. Not even Hercules had risen from the dead. And they mocked him and said, well, you know, come back and we'll hear you another time. And a handful of people left with Paul. But Paul was very clear. God no longer overlooks ignorance. There is no longer an excuse. He furnished to the world the proof of his majesty and his divinity with the raising of Jesus from the dead. And that very one will judge mankind. He is that king we read about on that throne. He is that king he talked about in Matthew 25. He is that king in Revelation 20, verse 11. In Acts chapter 26, 19 to 20, the passage I do want us to read. As Paul is giving his defense before King Agrippa, he says in verse 19, So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. What heavenly vision? Go back to verse 16. Verse 15, it's Jesus talking. He says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting after he says, Who are you, Lord? Verse 16, but get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, to whom I'm sending you. The very people I just rescued you from, I'm sending you back to them. Remember Ananias told him also, in chapter 22, verse 16, as we get what Ananias says, and in chapter 9, Ananias says God said that Paul was his chosen tool or instrument, that he would take the word of God, the gospel, to the Jews and to the Gentiles and before kings. And verse 18, here's the reason he's sending them to the Jews and Gentiles. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and in an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Jesus is saying, the reason I'm sending you to your brethren and to the Gentiles in all the world is so they might be rescued from darkness. They might turn from Satan to God, turn from darkness to light, and they might be forgiven and saved of their sins. And then verse 19, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Jews and Gentiles alike. No one else can do it for them. They have to do it. Second Peter 3 9, we're told that God doesn't wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This as Peter said to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. No one else can do it for them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Keith read for us a scripture reading, and we're going to read it in just a few minutes. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're told that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to give an account of the deeds that we have done. They must repent individually and perform deeds appropriate to repentance, as Paul said in Acts 26 and verse 20. And then once we become saints, once we have obeyed the gospel, we need to make sure that no one else, we're not relying on anyone else to repent for us. That as we sin, that we get over whatever pride stands in our way. And that we humble ourselves that we're able to repent of those things. In Acts 8.22, Paul told Simon of Samaria, formerly the sorcerer, after he had become a Christian and he sinned in trying to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit, Peter says, you need to pray to God and ask for forgiveness. In 1 John 1, 1.9, we're told that if we confess our sins to God, he will forgive us. Why do we confess our sins to God? 2 Samuel 12, 13. When David was confronted with his grave sin, he said, I have sinned before the Lord. It starts with God first. We also need to repent to one another as we hurt one another. But we need to repent to God. The other thing. So their brother, these five brothers had a brother in torments. They had sins not repented of. They had a brother in torments that could not repent for them, even knowing where they might end up. But Abraham points out they had Moses and the prophets. 
Luke 29, 16, verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. That's his answer to send someone back from the dead. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You realize that the five brothers had the same information available to them that the rich man had in life and chose to ignore. Just as the Jewish people and religious leaders of Jesus' day in Matthew 15, 7 and 9, we're going to talk about the Mark account of this later on tonight. The Jews worshipped God in vain. Jesus said they say the right things, but their hearts are far from Him. He says, in vain do they worship me, teaching the precepts and doctrines of men. He said Isaiah, who lived long ago, prophesied about them. Well, Isaiah prophesied about those in his day too. What Jesus is saying is the attitude hasn't changed much. You say all the right things. You pay lip service, but your heart is far away. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the scriptures are inspired by God. That means that literally means God breathed. Is what that word inspired means. God breathed. And they are they're there to equip the saint for every good work. They are all that we need. They're what they needed then, and they're what we need now. They have Moses and the prophets. We have the completed word of God. There's no excuse. The scriptures provide everything to equip the saint for every good work it says. What I want us to read is in 2 Peter 3, 1 to 2. And hear the words of Peter that says to mankind today what we still need to remember. He says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Wait a minute. What did Peter say back in chapter 1, verse 12? He says in verse 12, Therefore I'll always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Peter's saying, I'm about to die. I'm not always going to be here with you. And you, But here's the interesting thing to me. He's saying you know these things. You not only know it, you're established in the truth. And yet he says, I'm going to keep hitting you over the head with it and over and over and over so that when I'm gone, you will know it. You can refer back to it. So he says in chapter 3, Remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Not only do saints today have Moses and the prophets, but even more than that, we have Jesus and his apostles. Mankind would stand without excuse if we stand before God. I repent. Not only did this, this rich man's five brothers have Moses and the prophets, same as he did. They also had the ability to hear and obey. In Luke 16, 29, he says, let them hear them. They had the same chances to hear and obey the word of God as the rich brother who was now in torments. No other, no other special advantage. They had it. In James chapter 1, and verse 21, James says, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. And in the whole context there in verses 22 to 25 is James saying, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. If they were devout Jews, they would be at the synagogue every week. They would hear the word of God read out loud. They would hear the religious leaders telling it on the street corners. And all their pious and religiousness. But they, like them, were just hearers. That's why Jesus said, their hearts are far away from them. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away. James is saying, don't be like that. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. There are those that can quote whole swaths of scripture. There are some people I have heard that can quote a lot more than I can. But yet they'll tell you that you need to say a sinner's prayer to be saved. It's not enough to hear it. It's not even enough to know it. We have to obey it. We have to practice it. We have to put in practice what we have read. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. The whole context there is back in verse 1 all the way through 7. But Paul said his job in verse 5 as an apostle was to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake. Why? 
One, that was his mission given from God, as he pointed out to King Agrippa, as we read in Acts 26. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, that we're to take captive every thought obedient to Christ. Paul says, so his job was to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. I really appreciate the song selection Dad led us in singing this morning. We sang Seeking the Lost. In a few minutes, we're going to be singing Rescue the Perish. Our job as saints is what Paul's was to teach the gospel. Why? So that we might bring about the obedience of faith among all men for his name's sake. That is our goal as saints, is to take as many people with us as we can. In Romans 6, 16 to 18, Paul told the Romans, we are slaves to what we obey, either sin, that will result in death or righteousness, resulting in life. In Luke 16, 31, Abraham responded to this rich man who said, no, if someone rises from the dead, they will repent. He said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. It's true of the lost today. We don't have time this morning, so I'd encourage you to read Acts 2, 22 to 24, and Acts 2, 32 to 36, if you haven't already. In these passages, Peter makes it clear both twice during his sermon that Jesus was crucified and he was raised from the dead. And in verse 36, he ends his sermon by saying, This man who you put to death, God has made both Lord and Christ. He says he has been brought back to life. And yet, what did the Jews with him? 3,000 is an impressive number, but how many were there? How many Jews chased Paul from city to city, even at some point stoning him in Lystra and leaving him for dead? How often did they chase him out of each city all the way until he was shackled and sent to Rome? Why? Because one was sent back from the dead. Seen by 500 people all at once. Walked on earth another 40 days before ascending. And yet that did not cause them to repent. They had Moses and the prophets. They had one given back to them from the dead. Even before that, how many times did Jesus raise other people from the dead? With Lazarus. In John chapter 12, they said, we need to put Lazarus to death because everyone's believing in Jesus because he's walking around. And we need to put Jesus to death. They had Moses and the prophets, and yet that was their heart. Abraham is right. He's telling this rich man, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets... They're not going to be persuaded even if someone does rise from the dead. The Jewish leader says, we need to put Lazarus back in his tomb. Because he's a walking billboard of the divinity and majesty of Jesus. And people are believing him in droves because of him. That was their attitude. Peter pointed out that Jesus rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of God as Christ and Lord. Many then and now still reject the word of God. Even after one so mighty returned from the dead. So that we would no longer have to fear death. These five brothers were in danger because they had a death to meet. In Luke 16, 30, their brother in torment worried that they would meet his fate if they did not repent by the time they too died. If they died in the state that he knew they were in, they would give him comfort. He didn't want that. He didn't want it badly enough. He was begging Abraham to send this man back from the dead to warn them. Makes you wonder if they knew who Lazarus was. Did they all live together? Why would it matter that Lazarus went back if they didn't know he had died? But Abraham's point was it doesn't matter. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. In Hebrews 9.27, see, they have the same problem that those in the world have today. There's a death to me. Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for men to die once, and then comes the judgment. Death comes to all. Luke chapter 16, verse 22, and this, this little story Jesus tells, tells us death comes to the rich and the poor. It does not matter how great one is, how small one is, death comes for us all. I like this picture. It shows the representation of death, the grim reaper with the sky. But the tombstones could represent this marble tombstone for the rich and the wooden cross for the poor. Death comes for us all. It doesn't matter who we are in life. And their five brothers were in danger. And they have what the lost have, and that they have a judgment to face. In Luke 16, 23, we read that he had opened his eyes in Hades. 
And if you look at the Greek word for Hades, we find it's the receptacle of the dead, where even angels await judgment. Look in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment. That word hell is the only time this Greek word is translated that way, and it's the word for Tartaros. If you look it up, it means the deepest abyss of Hades. This is not the hell that we're going that is going to be there in that, that eternity. After the judgment day, when the righteous are sent to eternal life and the wicked to eternal punishment, or that second death, that eternal lake of fire, they're awaiting judgment, he says in verse 4. They're reserved for judgment. Tartaros means the deepest abyss of Hades. Peter's saying here, that's how far down they are. That's how dark it is when he talks about the darkness that is the blackest of black. Jude 6 also talks about this reservation for judgment. In Jude verse 6, he says, "...and angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he's kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day." Hades is the receptacle of the dead where even angels await judgment. Jesus talked about a time in John 5, 28-29, a day will come when all in the tombs will hear his voice and enter into their eternal suffering or rest after judgment. That word for tombs is a Greek word that means a place of internment. It's not necessarily talking about the grave in the ground, but where their souls are at. They will rise from the tombs, they'll hear his voice and enter eternal suffering or rest. Matthew 25, 31-46, Revelation 20, 11-15, speak of that great day. Revelation 20, 11-15, as we just read, it said, Death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. That is hell. That's that eternal fire. Matthew 25, 41, prepared for the devil and his angels. It will be emptied on the great day of judgment, either into eternal life, eternal bliss or eternal punishment, which will be eternal suffering. Keith read for us this morning, 2 Corinthians 5, 9-11, and I invite you to turn your Bibles back there with me. As we conclude this section, looking at 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 9. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 9. He says, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Solomon speaks about this in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Verse 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we're made manifest to God. And I hope that we're made manifest also in your conscience. Knowing there's a judgment day awaiting us all. Saints are to persuade men, that is to teach the gospel and keep ourselves holy. 2 Peter 3, 10-12 says, knowing that all things are going to be burned up, knowing the end of the world will end that way, what kind of people ought we to be but in holy conduct and godliness? We need to keep ourselves holy but also persuade men. The rich man's five brothers were in danger. They had a brother in torments they had sins not repented of. They had a brother in torments that could not repent for them. They had Moses and the prophets. They had an ability to hear and obey. They had a debt to meet and they had judgment to face. The rich man's five brothers were in danger and he wanted them warned. All the lost of the world are in the same danger. They also need to be warned while there's still a chance. The lost of the world are like that rich man's five brothers. They have God's word and they need to hear it and obey it to avoid eternal torments. Our souls will live on forever in one of two very different places as we talked about in Luke 16 and as Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, 34, 41 and verse 46. When we die, time for change is over. Either we'll enter paradise to meet Lazarus and Abraham or into Tartaros with false teachers and disobedient angels to await the final judgment. All need to prepare for eternity. That is the point we ought to get from this lesson. All need to prepare for eternity. There's nothing better to enter than eternal bliss. There's nothing worse to enter than eternal torments. So the question this morning is, where will your soul reside for eternity? Will the angels bear you away to bliss, or will you awake in torments? Like the rich man's five brothers, the lost need to hear and obey the word of God. And for our sakes, we need to keep ourselves in holy conduct and godliness. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be. To repent of your sins, 
and be baptized. Just as Peter told the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 38. As Ananias told Saul of Tarsus in Acts 22 verse 16. If you are a Christian this morning in error, not living the way that you should, you need to repent and live in holy and godly conduct and make it right before God. 2 Peter 3.11 Whatever your request this morning, whether for subject to invitation in any way, come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.